My name is Amy Silman and my studio is in Southold um, on the North Fork. I had no idea about the collection before because uh, I think one often doesn't know about collections, what's really in a collection. It's, it's always um, part, mostly not shown. So you see the greatest hits and I kind of knew some of the greatest hits that are here. But I was really curious to go dig into the um, collections, um, lesser known artists and lesser known works and see like where it proliferated, where it, it lacked. I mean, for an example, there was this artist, Connie Fox, whom I had not heard of, who actually sadly passed away during the period that we were curating or we were choosing. And then I read about her in the paper and she was kind of on my short list anyway. And I read these amazing things about her, that she was a dedicated painter, a really interesting painter out, out here, I think on the South Fork. And um, I thought, okay, you know, let's put her in. And at some point it started, at one point it was maybe gonna just be Saul Steinberg, um, because I love Saul Steinberg. He's literally one of, I think he's the reason I'm an artist, honestly, um, for long reasons I could explain another time. But um, at one point I thought maybe I should just select him because there's a lot of work by him in the collection and it's wonderful work. But it broadened itself. And then as an artist, I'm really interested in this forceful, um, kind of aggressive way of like pitting abstract structure against um, image kind of fragment. And so given my interest in, in puncturing each of those two sides of what you could call a binary with each other, I wanted to expand outward from that kind of position and put people together who somehow ran a gamut from purely abstract work like Agnes Martin, that's completely just a gray slab over a black slab, to like something like Saul Steinberg that's literally a cartoon about soldiers. And then I just thought at one point, let me just be completely straightforward and put it in a, in a row. And I literally took all the stuff that I had picked. And of course, there were millions of things that I couldn't fit in. I could have had a show that was three times as big. Um, I think that's just my way because <laughs> I've done collection um, curation before and I've always had to cut out way more than I showed. Um, so I put everything in a, in a row in my room, like on a Xerox, and I tried to figure out a visual logic that would literally link from one thing to the next. And that, that meant, in some cases, that I had to cut things out that I would really love to have included, um, but I needed um, a link that made Sidney Albertini go to Trevor Wingfield, go to you know, Joe Zucker, you know, in certain cases I needed something that bridged something that was two things next to each other. So there was a tremendous um, visual gamesmanship and this is a kind of game that I love. Well, the work I chose here just happened to be a work that I had done in Southold this summer. Um, it's called The Banana Tree and it's kind of a, a it, I think it's one of the weirdest paintings I made in the last few months. It's a, uh, it's a picture of, I mean, it's a picture, it's not a picture, but it's a sort of structure of interruption where um, this kind of insistent, almost calligraphic black shape that's almost like a C or a wedge um, or a, I mean a wrench or something keeps kind of butting in on what looks like maybe a kind of yellow and black or blue and yellow and black kind of tree form. And then there's this bright yellow that's kind of behind it, but this black keeps interrupting it. And it was, it was a very funny, weird painting that wasn't like all the other paintings I was doing this summer. It was slow, kind of agonized. Um, it was a real troubling and troubled painting. Um, to make and to try to resolve. And I kind of left it as like, a, like it's literally like a jigsaw puzzle that can't fit and is having a fight with itself. That's what that painting sort of is to me. Um, and so I was like, there's pattern, there's color, there's shape, there's this jagged thing. And then underneath, if you say banana tree is the title, everyone goes, oh yeah, there are the bananas. So you can kind of 
ignore the sort of theme or you can just resolve the problem of the painting by the title. And so this kind of relationship between language and image is very, this is my, that's what I do all day. That's all I do is um, go in and out of language. I wanted um, Charlotte Park in the show. I had seen her work for the first time at the parish in the show that was uh, called, it was about women working out east um, that I was in. And when I came here, I saw also the Pearl Fine was in there. Um, there might have, and there were probably other um, pieces that overlapped, but um, the Pearl Fine and the Charlotte Park were fabulous paintings that really blew my mind when I came out to that show. There were so many other things that could have been in this lineup, so many things. I mean, it was agony to cut people. Um, but the Charlotte Park stated itself with brilliant color. And like I said, my painting was sort of about the war between black and yellow, you know, as colors. Um, and then there was like kind of this Charlotte Park thing where it was really a painting of orange and black. And it was almost the black, like I felt connected to it because it was like in my painting, almost forming into a figure, but it was never quite clinched as a figure. So then there was this moment where I found the Lester Johnson drawing of a man with a pole. And I was doing this kind of visual like I said, this kind of hyperlinking. And I was like, wow, if you put Lester Johnson's drawing of a man with a pole right next to Charlotte Parks, you start to see the, the possibility of a figure in her work and vice versa. You see the abstraction in his drawing. And then of course I had Betty Parsons who could come right into the middle and be a shard like what I had in my painting, but a blown out one that was really emptied. And so I was kind of trying to build this language of shard fragment, shattered thing, thing that kind of comes together as a figure and then erases the figure itself. I wanted to um, really establish the line as a line of thought, as a sentence, as a mood swing. That's the thing I was kind of writing about and thinking about is literally like, what is a mood swing? A mood that swings from very somber abstraction all the way to like chaos and into laughter, like almost uncomfortable laughter. And so I wanted the line to represent a narrative. It's a sequence of steps that actually does make a describable, logical meaning. I wanted people to understand immediately from a, vi from a visual perspective that this is a lineup and see it in a row. For me, the role of the parish is very um, kind of what I, what I believe a museum does for me always, which is that it provides me with a hub where I can see serious work and where I can think about the unpacking of works in real life, not just in books. I am deeply happy that this beautiful building exists. The architecture is important to me too, because it's not in a shed, it's in this amazing hall. It's for me, it's all about the work. It's all about the art and the commitment to really serious collecting and serious art um, that could be uh, kind of like what you do after you move here like a bunch of people move here and then you like have a bunch of more people who love those people and then at that point if they stick their little stick in the ground and say we're gonna make a building that um, really shows preserves and honors all of these amazing people who are here um, that is a museum. Joanne Greenbaum and I live in New York City but a lot of the time now in Greenport, New York on the North Fork. 
when you invited me to be in the show, I, like everyone, looked on the website to see things in the collection, and of course, it was kind of overwhelming. Um, my, the first thing I landed on was the thing that I, I stayed with the most, which was the small John Farron painting that I felt somehow related to what I did. I also loved the fact that that painting was made the year I was born. So it, it just kind of had a little bit of a, a nice serendipity to it. But also just the way that the painting was made um, just relates a lot to a lot of the work that, that I'm doing now in terms of color and form and um, just the kind of casualness of my process. So that painting was kind of the basis. And then I thought about what I had in the studio that could go with that because I wanted to show in this installation sort of everything that I do, which is painting, sculpture, drawing, making books. So somehow I really wanted to bring all of that together. And now that we've installed it, I think that we have done that. I've always been a huge Lee Bontecu fan, just the, like everything about her work. Um, and so when I found the Lee Bontecu drawing, I just wanted to include it, um, just in terms of sort of the, the kind of framing device and really the carefulness of, of the way that she drew. The other drawing, the Alfonso Osorio book, I just really related to just because I do so much of, of my own handmade books and so I mean I have hundreds of them now done in the last seven years and went, so I wanted to also show that aspect of what I do and so when I saw the the Alfonso Osorio book I just really related to that um, activity of like making a book with drawings in it and you know it's a very um, intimate type of activity it's also very meditative for me anyway so when I saw that I just related to it and wanted to show it in a vitrine with just some of my drawings and the little Ray Parker painting of course uh, mostly because of the color and also because I just know that in my own studio I have so many really small paintings that are just kind of sitting around that I kind of have this idea that the Ray Parker painting was something that was just sitting around his studio. I don't think, I have a feeling it was just kind of something that he might not have even intended to ever show. I'm a late comer to sculpture. I started, you know, maybe 20 years ago. And I didn't, I don't, certainly don't call myself a sculptor. Or maybe I call myself a painter who makes sculpture. But I took a class at Greenwich House Pottery and I just kind of fell in love with clay. And it just felt really like good physically to, to play with clay. So I got into it just because I was feeling that my paintings were very much about um, fictional structures. And so at some point I just said, well, what would happen if I just tried to make that myself? So that's kind of how it came about. And now, you know, maybe even during the pandemic, because it was so quiet and I had so much time, I ended up making a lot, a lot of clay sculpture in my studio out here. And, and I continue to do that as well. I think all my work is very playful and I think with the sculpture like I'm much more open to play. Like I think painting is a much more intellectual activity for me and that sculpture is more okay I'm finished with painting for the day let me go to my little clay room and just watch a movie and make a sculpture. I mean that's kind of how they come about. When I was going through the collection online I had seen I was looking especially for sculpture and I saw this terracotta sculpture by Dorothy Frankel and who I don't know and I don't know her work but I liked it just because I was making 
my own sculptures out of terracotta and not glazing them the way hers aren't glazed. And somehow I just thought, you know, I think it would be really great to just make sculpture just with the, the bare terracotta and then show them together with, with, with her piece. Alan Shields is somebody who, when I was in college, was somebody who people were talking about a lot. And I, one of my teachers um, was good friends with him. So, you know, I was just always looking at his work and I always thought, you know, because it was, at the time, it was really different than a lot of the work that was, was going on. Like it, it, he worked with elements of craft, which I really liked. He also, you know, did a lot of things with fabric, with dyeing. And like this piece that I chose, which I think is made out of like paper and string, um, it just, I just related to, to the, just the idea of making things and being open to, to, to adding sort of craft in, in, into, into one's work. I mean, something that was always kind of not allowed in the, in the art world was, you know, to add ceramics and sewing and fabric and crafts and craft materials in, into your work. Like it wasn't considered proper. I mean, now I have to say, you know, my favorite store is, is Michael's, you know, where you can just go in there and there's so many ideas just walking around Michael's craft store. And, you know, and I just relate a lot to, to his, his process of, of making things. It just seems like everything that I'm looking at in my selection has this idea of the frame or like a framing device and that I, I love the idea of sort of the frame and then a collection of things that go in the frame. So, and collections of things that go in a frame doesn't have to be things, it can be marks, it can be gestures, but all of these things are kind of included in kind of a, like a framing device. And I think that pretty much sums kind of everything that, that we've put in our, our selection. I think there's been a big correction in what I've seen in the last couple years at the parish. So I think I've seen pretty much a really great range of the kind of shows. I mean, yes, I think that there is the tradition of the abstract expressionists, you know, the Pollocks, the Krasners, that, you know, kind of s somehow set the, the, the tone. But, you know, I think that that is slowly changing and that I think it seems like that the parish is making a huge effort to um, embrace more diverse populations that are, that are here. I'm Mel Kendrick and uh, I live in North Haven, New York and Manhattan. The process was, was very interesting uh, going through the collection. Uh, of course, I waited too long, so, <laughs> but I still there are plenty of, there's a lot of good work to look at. And uh, I really had no idea, as I've watched other people, you know, you put friends in, you can, you know, influences, you know, how to go. Uh, and, then I thought about these pieces that I had that I, they're really prototypes. They're not a sculpture uh, per se, not a permanent sculpture. And uh, but I've been working on them and I was very uh, enthusiastic about them. And I thought, well, what if I, you know, put, you know, some parts of that? Because this would be a much larger piece if it were in concrete and outdoors. This is five elements and it could be many more. Uh, and so I uh, played around with that and actually made a model and I, I, I view the, the unifying thing of these shapes that I'm working with is the line 
Uh, in fact, it's derived from a piece that was in my show, Seeing Things at Things at the Parish. And uh, there was a small piece on the shelf called White Wine that was uh, these shapes, same angles, uh, but many more of them uh, seen up against the wall. And I wanted to, for some time, to make them large enough to experience by walking between them. And uh, so I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the installation. So then, you know, the, the last thing I got to was, you know, how does this relate to, you know, other work or the work I'm going to choose? Uh, and uh, so there were, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's I think it's a fairly sparse group, but and there are friends in it, of course, too. Uh, but uh, I had the idea of uh, using Barry LeVay, who a very good friend, and uh, because his work is always about lines and objects and how you move around them. Uh, Dorothea, because Dorothea Rockburn, uh, because her work in this era uh, was organized by the line, uh, by the straight line <clears throat> put directly on the wall. And uh, that's a thing that influenced me uh, way back. And so, you know, I'm organizing by the line. And so then when I started looking further, I saw this beautiful little Jennifer Bartlett that like, couldn't be more direct because it's two square foot panels connected by a white line that isn't really there because it goes over the wall. And uh, lastly, Peter Campus, whose work I've always liked, uh, because when I was going through the uh, catalog, uh, I saw a piece that's uh, Bellport Harbor, one of very static, and has the horizon line. And uh, I thought it was very good, and I related to it because of my own <clears throat> uh, time spent on the water and with the water, and uh, it also, I mean, if I were to keep going, I, it jumps to this idea of, uh, that I've always had about a water line, perhaps in a room, uh, things above the water line, below the water line, and uh, that is something that I've been thinking about in a number of uh, sculptures, but I never really talked about because there is no water, and I thought that's kind of remote, but it was uh, great to put this piece in. I'm really happy coming up with the Peter Campus because of all the water references, seen or unseen, in this notion of lifting something out or, you know, I always wanted to you know, th think of putting something in the water so that you only see one part at high tide, one part, you know, the whole thing at low tide. Uh, so that's just a, an ongoing side issue for me. But uh, the, the other thing is, I mean, about Dorothea's piece, uh, that is particularly important to me is that it's physically, in my mind, held to the wall by the line that's drawn on the wall. So in fact, every piece here is, uh, I mean, the line is the focus in some ways, uh, to my mind, the organizing principle or, uh, you know, the way it exists in the world. Uh, the, the material is expanded polystyrene foam, which uh, I cut with a hot wire. Uh, and uh, the, you know, made, they're basically made by hand. And uh, this is always the first stage when I'm making concrete work, uh, work in concrete, like the standing block that's in front of the museum now, uh, that first existed in this same material, uh, which I arrived at because it has all the line marks, the cut marks, much the way my very much smaller works did with a uh, saw. Uh, I mean, it's sort of a, and you know, and the imperfections of dragging, you know, this hot wire through the material. So they're actually all were cut at three degrees off perpendicular, which seems to be the number I like. And so that's how they sometimes they'll match up, sometimes they'll go opposite directions. So in my mind, sometimes they look like they might be falling or they're precarious or, you know, that uh, whole thing about, you know, narrowing a column, maybe they look taller than they are. But anyway, it's an experience that sort of pushes you back and forth as you experience them by walking through, which is ultimately the exciting thing about doing this, even though it's a prototype. This gave me a really good chance to uh, experience them that way.
Well, the parish is, is a great museum, and I actually showed some of my concrete pieces uh, at its, the old location. It is still, uh, you know, because of the East End, because of, you know, artists I know, I, I, I know a lot of people in the collection, uh, and a lot of people, uh, you know, friends like, like this, uh, you know, are very, like this museum a lot. And then my, my but it all, uh, you know, there's work of mine in the museum. I'm uh, doing this Artist Choose Artist show. Um, that was a very exciting idea, but it was also super challenging to me because uh, of these spaces are large, and I had no idea how my work would would work. But I mean, I love the ceilings and the concrete floors. I mean, it's a great space to show work in, and uh, really, I had uh, no problems. <laughs> I mean, it was really nice to see things from a distance or find things in a smaller room. Uh, it's just a great space to show work, and particularly sculpture. It's in the middle of this area that's rich in this artistic history, and I think the parish has done very well in collecting and representing, uh, you know, what you could call, but I always hate those things, like East End artists, Hamptons artists. That it's, it's just a, a bunch of people uh, who happen to, you know, be here and like to work here. Uh, so. I, that, I'm glad that the parish has made an effort to have so many pieces from that group. Uh, by the same token, uh, it's a great, it's a big museum and a great location, so I know that there's much more outreach going on than before, and that, that can only, only get better. I mean, and I think that's true, you know, every museum is dealing with that. Uh, so, you know, that's why I say it's a balance, because it's not all community. It still has to keep, have certain standards, and I think the collection speaks to that of, you know, the very, very important artists.